Hello, welcome to New America. I'm Fuzz Hogan, managing editor here at New America, which means I edit the new digital magazine Weekly Wonk. Check it out at weeklywonk.org. But I'm actually here to welcome you to this event. The Obama administration and the press leak investigations and surveillance in post 9-11 America. If you haven't had a chance to see this report, which I have, it made me want to rename the group that wrote it Community Protect Sources, because it's all about uh, protecting sources. But those of us who've done the job of investigative reporting know the sources are our lifeblood. And if they come for the sources, we better speak. And so, and also if you're familiar with um, the court cases against sources, it's, it's a bleak picture uh, up to and including U.S. Attorney in Chicago, who is a hero to investigative journalists in Chicago, Pat Fitzgerald, you know, who put a lot of guys away who investigative journalists were investigating. But when he came here to prosecute Scooter Libby, sort of blankly asserted that journalists who get leaked information are witnesses to a crime, which puts us in the target, in the crosshairs. So thanks for coming. It's a great report. If you haven't read it yet, please do. These fellows will give a sort of fine discussion for it, and we're pretty excited to have them. Uh, and before I introduce the moderator, one bit of business. It's being webcast and also on C-SPAN. So if you have a question when the question time comes, please be sure to wait for the mic and speak into the mic. And now your moderator, Kurt Wimmer, the U.S. Chair of Covington and Burling's Privacy and Data Security Privacy Practice, a pretty smart guy in First Amendment law. He gave us a briefing yesterday, which was very helpful. In his past, he was general counsel at Gannett and is representing a 70-member media coalition advocating for a federal shield bill. Thanks for all for coming. And Kurt, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Fuzz. Let me just say um, it's a great honor to be here along with uh, these experts. I think I'm the only person on this panel I've never heard of. Uh, <laughs> so let me give you just a brief. Uh, this is one of those panels where everyone needs no introduction, but we do it anyway. But I'll do it briefly. Uh, to my left is Lynn Downey, Jr. He's the Weill Family Professor of Journalism at the Cronkite School at Arizona State. Um, very well known to this audience, of course, as Vice President at Large of the Washington Post where he was executive editor from 1991 to 2008 and spent 44 years, surprisingly enough, mm -hmm. in the Washington Post newsroom. Uh, to Lynn's left is, uh, my apologies, Joel Simon. Uh, Joel Simon is executive director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, which is the organization that uh, published this exceptional report that we'll be talking about today. Uh, since his appointment as executive director of CPJ in 2006, uh, Joel has led the organization through a period of expansion, including launching the Global Campaign Against Impunity, establishing a journalist assistance program, and spearheading CPJ's efforts to defend press freedom in the digital space. And finally, to uh, Joel's left is uh, Rajiv Chandra Sakharan. Uh, also very well known to this audience uh, from his longstanding work at the Washington Post. Uh, he's currently uh, senior correspondent and associate editor at the Washington Post. Also the author of Imperial Life in the Emerald City, um, a best-selling book which um, became uh, the basis for the movie The Green Zone with Matt Damon and uh, a terrific piece of work uh, both in film and in pa on paper. Um, he's also been the Post's bureau chief in Baghdad and he's been journalist in residence at the International Reporting Project at the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies in Washington. So today I'd like to start off with asking Len if he would give a um, sort of an overview of the report that we're here to discuss. I'll do that. I wanted to say quickly at the outset because the, uh, uh, the question of uh, reporters being subpoenaed was brought up uh, just yesterday or the day before James Rising of the New York Times lost his appellate court case. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to not have him be forced to testify about a source, about a story that's in, your, it's in the report when you find his name, James Dreisen. Uh, you'll see that it was up to the point of, uh, of this appellate court decision, which now has gone against him, so that case will probably go to the Supreme Court, which will be a major, major test of uh, the relationships between uh, reporters and their sources. What rights do reporters have? to not be forced to, uh, to give, their, give away their sources. Uh, and uh, the shield law plays into that. If there were a shield law, that case might be different than it is now. Uh, but there is no shield law. So that, that could be a very, very important Supreme Court case in a year or so, however long it takes. Um, I was asked to do this report by the Committee to Protect Journalists because I'd written a couple pieces for the Outlook section of the Washington Post uh, late last year and uh, in May of this year. 
about the uh, Obama administration's war on leaks, uh, the very aggressive way in which they've been going after government officials who provide information to reporters, particularly uh, uh, particularly um, uh, classified information, but not exclusively. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was asked by the committee to uh, explore the whole relationship between the Obama administration and the press uh, in the, in the uh, context of the kinds of work that the Committee to Protect Journalists does worldwide about uh, relationships between governments and the press and the, and the protections of, uh, of the press's right to work. And I was very surprised by what I found uh, because it went way beyond the war on leaks. Uh, into a lot of other areas uh, in which this, I found this administration to be remarkably controlling, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about how that, how that uh, happened. Uh, the report and my findings are based on several dozen interviews <coughs> with reporters and news executives and government transparency advocates and current and former government officials, uh, plus research that I did and that Sarah Rafsky of the Committee to Protect Journalists did in all the leaks investigations, which I think those are the most complete accounts of those that anybody else has, uh, has come up with, during both the Bush and Obama administrations, so we could make comparisons. And the Patriot Act, the FISA law and court, and the National Security Agency's communication surveillance programs. In summary, in a one sentence summary of that big long report, is that the Obama administration's aggressive war and leaks and its determined efforts to control information that the news media needs to hold the government accountable for its actions are without equal since the Nixon administration and in direct conflict with President Obama's often stated goal of making his administration the most transparent in American history. Parenthetically, I should add, I'm old enough that I was one of the, reporter, one of the editors on the Watergate story uh, in the early 1970s, so I, I, I make that comparison uh, with knowledge. Uh, so there are six components to what, I, to what I found. The first is the chilling effects of these unprecedented number of leaks, leaks investigations and prosecutions, along with the concerns about the NSA surveillance programs. Obama administration officials and employees are increasingly afraid to talk to the press. Every single journalist I talked to said that's the case for their sources in government, whether or not they deal in classified information, but especially if it involves classified information. Six government employees and two government contractors, including Edward Snowden, of course, have been prosecuted since 2009 for leaks of alleged classified information to the press. And it's been, it's been done, these prosecutions have been done under a 1917 Espionage Act that was enacted during World War I uh, to punish people for uh, uh, spying for foreign, for foreign entities. And here we have reporters, here we have government officials talking to reporters who are prosecuted under that act. There are only three such prosecutions in the 90 years from 1917 until 2009. Uh, when, they, when they began during the Obama administration. In several of these investigations, probably the most frightening thing for government officials, the Justice Department and the FBI were successful in secretly subpoenaing and seizing telephone and email traffic between government officials and reporters for news organizations that included the New York Times, Fox News, and the Associated Press. There were revisions made by the Justice Department in the guidelines for such subpoenas after an outcry from the news media over those cases, but they still allowed the Attorney General to refuse to notify news media about subpoenas of their communication records uh, and also still contain an exception for any leaked information that the government considers potentially harmful to national security. That is a very big loophole that you could drive a very large truck through. The journalist shield legislation endorsed by the president and recently approved by a Senate committee also has a similarly broad exception for national security information, although it would require a judge to make a final decision about it rather than leaving it to the attorney general. Congressional passage of such a seal law is still very much in doubt and, and, and also in doubt is how it would define a journalist to be covered by the law. In, this, in, the, in the digital age, obviously, the, de the definition of what a journalist is very broad. Uh, anybody can commit journalism of one kind or another. And is this, is, is, there's a concern that Joel may talk about uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, that by defining who a journalist is could lead to government licensing a journalist or saying you're a journalist, but you're not a journalist, depending upon what action the government wants to take. 
Washington reporters told me they worry about compromising their sources when their contacts with them could be traced through surveillance and investigations of phone and email records. And as a result, they said many, many sources will no longer talk to them at all. And we're not just talking about these aid investigations. There have been lots of other investigations that have not led to prosecutions in which there have been routinely been lie detector tests given to government officials who are suspected of talking with the press. And reporters naturally do not want to get their sources in trouble. Number two is the insider threat program. In the aftermath of Private Manning's leaks of documents to WikiLeaks in the news media, President Obama ordered the establishment of a pervasive insider threat program throughout the government. Not many people know about this. Employees of all federal departments and agencies have been ordered to monitor and report, and I quote, any suspected insider threat activity, which includes communications with the press. Stephen Aftergood, the director of the Project on Government Secrecy at the Federation of American Scientists, who's one of the leading government transparency advocates in Washington, told me that this has created internal surveillance, heightened the degree of paranoia in government, and made people conscious of contacts with the public, advocates, and the press. The third issue, the Obama administration's centralized message control. All, all incoming administrations want to try to control the message for political advantage, but senior administration officials of this administration uh, uh, have uh, call, uh, what they call unauthorized contacts with the, press, with the press are discouraged. Instead, they make clear that they and the president do not want any kinds of leaks to the news media, and not just those including classified information. Routine qu inquiries from reporters are most often referred to public affairs officials, who reporters have found to be unresponsive, hostile, and even abusive. If they fail to discourage stories that they, don't, that, that they don't think they would like, they sometimes refuse to provide reporters public information that we all have a right to. The government transparency that President Obama has repeatedly promised has turned out to be a sophisticated public relations strategy honed during his two presidential campaigns of creating government websites and social media operations to dispense to the public large amounts of favorable information and images generated by his administration while restricting the government's exposure to accountability probing by the press. Those websites are full of government-created content. Photos of Obama taken by the White House press photographer when all other photographers are banned from most White House activities. Administration produced videos and even a faux newscast, it's one of my favorites, called West Wing Week, about administration activities that are closed to journalists, and then the White House presents its new supposed news coverage of those same events and ubiquitous posts by Obama aides on blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media to promote administration views. Frank Cessna, the former CNN reporter and anchor and now director of the School of Public Media, excuse me, of Media and Public Affairs at GW University, told me that the administration is using social media to end run the news media completely. Open dialogue with the public without filters is good, he said, and I agree with that, but if used for propaganda purposes and to avoid contact with journalists, it's a slippery slope. The fourth issue is the excessive classification of government information. Part of the problem reporters have, they call somebody up to ask them a, 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 a normal, a routine question, expecting a routine answer, and it turns out the information is classified, even though there seems to be no good reason for it. The Obama administration has recently taken credit for declassifying and posting on a new intelligence community website some of the previously secret documents explaining the NSA's communications surveillance program but it did so only after revelations by the press in stories based on documents leaked by Edward Snowden. The administration has not acted on a December 2012 report to the president by a congressionally authorized public interest declassification board, which recommended many specific steps to take to carry out the president's professed aim to reduce all this overclassification, which would free government officials to discuss more of the public's business with the press. The fifth issue is the failure to improve the Freedom of Information Act process. The Obama administration also has made little progress on another one of the president's first promises, uh, in fact, a directive that he issued on his first day in office in January 2009 to improve government responsiveness to FOI, FOIA requests. Reporters and government transparency advocates have found that too many government departments and agencies still reject far too many FOIA requests or delay forever in responding to them or demand expensive, excessive fees to fulfill them. An Associated Press survey earlier this year found that the number of FOIA requests from the press that were turned down on the grounds of national security or internal administration deliberations, another huge loophole, had actually increased during the Obama administration. 
more than 80 prominent organizations that advocate for increased government transparency he just met here last week in Washington to work on new recommendations to the Obama administration for how to finally make FOIA work better for the press and the public. But I've talked to some of their leaders and they're very worried about whether the administration will even listen to their recommendations. The fifth issue, the treatment of whistleblowers. President Obama also has said he supports encouraging and protecting government whistleblowers who reveal bureaucratic waste, fraud, and abuse. But he and his administration draw a disturbing distinction between that and revelations to the press about government policies and actions which they, for, for which they punish leaks, leaks with investigations, firings, and prosecutions. President Obama signed the Whistleblower Act of 2012 along with a policy directive aimed at protecting from retaliation all government whistleblowers, including intelligence agency employees. But at the very same time, his administration won an appellate court decision in August that takes away from many federal employees and designated national security sensitive positions the right to appeal personnel actions by their agencies, which of course could include retaliation for whistleblowing. That and the prosecutions of some whistleblowers as spies under the 1917 Espionage Act for providing information to the press leaves the president's real position on whistleblowing very unclear to me. And lastly, the, inter the international implications, which was of great interest, obviously, to the Committee to Protect Journalists. In addition to the threat posed to the work of foreign journalists by NSA surveillance, which, of course, they're not supposed to spy on American reporters or Americans, but they can uh, spy on the communications of, uh, of uh, non-American non citizens, obviously, including foreign reporters or uh, foreign sources for American reporters. The Obama administration's press policies provide a questionable example for other countries at a time when this administration has been outspokenly advocating for press and internet freedom in the rest of the world. President Obama is faced with many challenges during his remaining time in office, obviously. We've just been through one of them. The outcome of which will shape his legacy. One objective he could accomplish without outside opposition is fulfilling his very first promise, to make his administration the most transparent in history beginning by opening its closed doors to scrutiny by a free press. That's the summary. Lynn, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to invite anyone who is, uh, who's tweeting about, uh, about our discussion to use the hashtag Obama and the press. Um, and thanks again for the summary. It's really a terrific work. And it seems to me that this pulls together a number of disparate threads into a fabric that really discloses a lot about the overall thrust of the administration. Let me start by asking, for many years, there seemed to be a detente between government and the press in that we recognized that the government had secrets to keep and could try as hard as they would to keep them. Uh, we would try as hard as we could to get them. And the ones that were newsworthy and relevant and should be published, we would. Um, it seems in your report that you're now talking about an administration that has stepped over a line between those two areas in essentially chilling the ability of any of its um, members to speak right. to the press. Two historical things, to, three, three historical things to say about that. First of all, the Pentagon Papers decision by the Supreme Court, uh, which made a prior restraint virtually impossible in the United States, unique in all of the world. And therefore, if you're in administration, you're faced with the fact you can't stop us from publishing something in advance. You can only punish us and our sources afterwards. And that's important to keep in mind. Secondly is 9-11. Uh, a lot of attitudes changed uh, after 9-11. After uh, and uh, in, including uh, you know, uh, the, the whole balance between exactly what you were talking about, between uh, uh, revelations of government activity and national security and that, and that balance. I live with that balance, obviously, during the Bush administration when we published stories, including the CIA secret prison stories that required a lot of conversations with administration officials about whether we were going to publish that story and, if so, what details it would contain. Those, 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 those uh, um, um, conversations were useful, and they do continue during this administration, but in a somewhat different atmosphere, uh, as, as, as the report explains. And the third historical thing is that when Obama administration came into office, they were put under great pressure by the intelligence agencies who were upset by the previous stories, our, our secret prison stories, the New York Times NSA surveillance stories. They put a lot of pressure in the Obama administration to do something about it. Some of these investigations had begun under Bush but not produced prosecutions under pressure from the intelligence agencies and I should say from both Democrats and Republicans on the Hill and the intelligence committees also put great pressure on the administration. But also I believe that the president himself, he's not really spoken about this, but I believe the president himself also has a rather, he actually said something, he said some things about he does not want secrets revealed that are to put our boys at risk. Well, not all of these are really about that. Uh, but at the same time, I think he has a strong bent towards secrecy himself. 
So Rajiv, Joel, what do you think of the, the explanation? It's, it's pretty compelling. It is most certainly, and you know, I think the point Len makes, particularly as, 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 as an editor who's overseen the publication of, of, of some of these stories over time, and you look back at, um, at the CIA black site story, you look back at the New York Times' reporting on um, warrantless wiretapping, um, and, and the Bush administration's responses to those, uh, as well as the, the, the decisions and, and discussions that, that led up to the publications of stories, but particularly how, how previous administrations have responded to, uh, to, to stories they have not liked, they have thought, have compromised in their view national security. Um, and yet, uh, in, in most other cases, in previous administrations, there have been uh, expressions of of um, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know disgust, if you will. Um, uh, there have been perhaps some cursory investigations, but nothing of the sort that we're seeing now. And then when you look at some of the investigations that have taken place in recent years, um, and you compare them to some of the previous stories, it it seems like it's penny ante stuff. I mean, going after you know Tom Drake. Uh, at the NSA, uh, which you, you write about, or, or even, even the, the Ryzen case. In the grand scheme of things, those, uh, if you talk to national security experts, those stories uh, did, did not have a, 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 a meaningful impact on American national security. And yet, those are some of the cases that are being pursued or have been pursued in recent years with, with particular vigor. So there, there really is, has been a fundamental change, in my view, uh, in, in the approach taken by the government in, in recent years compared to in, in the preceding decades on these things. You could also argue in the two cases that Rajiv mentioned, these were classic whistleblowers even by the president's own definition. Indeed. It was about whether or not the NSA surveillance program was too expensive and protected privacy. It wasn't about the content of it whatsoever. And, and, and well, an argument Drake makes or made was that the, the documents found in his home weren't actually classified right, documents, right, and right. yet they still sort of went after, they eventually, but the case eventually fell apart. Right. Um, but yes. And, and, and what I want to do is sort of put, put the report, I mean, obviously, it's, I think it's made a very significant contribution. We've seen the attention it's gotten. Um, and I think that, you know, Len, you know, some of these, some of these obviously, investigations, people were aware of them, people were aware of these policies. But putting them all together suggests that this is not a haphazard response to certain particular events. There is a systematic effort here to marginalize and undermine the work of the press. And I think that's what the report really uh, accomplishes. And, and, and what I want to do is also talk about why we undertook it and what, what, what the significance of that is. You know, CPJ has been around um, since 1981. And we started out as a small group of US journalists focused mostly on the sort of life and liberty, if you will, of, of, of journalists around the world who work in repressive and dangerous environments and you know, really have to fear for their lives when they go out and do a story. And the, the, the uh, uh, framework in which CPJ was founded was a recognition that we have uh, journalists in this country have the unique protection of the First Amendment. Um, and so throughout our history, particularly in our early years when we were a small fledgling organization, we focused on those kinds of frontline uh, 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 reporting efforts. But, you know, th the recent events in this country and also our uh, conversations with journalists covering this administration led us to conclude that the atmosphere was fundamentally different. And that had an impact not only on the work of journalists here, but potentially on journalists around the world for a number of reasons. One is that, the, you know, one of, one, one of our um, colleagues wrote, you know, the U.S. press in some ways is the world's press. It reports for the world. So any, any erosion of press standards here has an impact on the information available to people everywhere in the world. Secondly, the U.S. media and, you, and the work of journalists inspires um, other journalists around the world. And so they are threatened by an erosion in standards here. And thirdly, because governments take solace from any um, uh, uh, deterioration in press freedom standards in this country, and it gives them potential cover to um, take repressive actions on their own. So we're, we, you know, we, we saw this pattern, and then we asked Len to carry this, to do this 
uh, report, and we asked them to do it independently. We provided uh, some research support. We helped edit, obviously. We reviewed it. But this is, these are Len's findings. These, these are his independent findings. And then we took the report and reviewed it both among our staff and at our board level and provided recommendations based on the report. Those, as well, were, were done independently. And that's how the process, process worked. This is pretty remarkable. This is an organization that, that normally devotes you know, its resources and still does to yeah. you know, uh, I investigating and, and seeking action to you know, journalists murdered in the Philippines yeah. or journalists jailed in right. Zimbabwe. And for, for CPJ to, to want to devote resources to, sh to shining a light on these issues and to, 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 to thoughtfully uh, uh, investigate them is, is a remarkable step for an international press freedom organization. It's really true. And you know, the Obama administration, as have many administrations before it, focuses a lot on trying to promote free expression yeah, in other countries. Absolutely. Um, what do you think that these, the, the types of issues that are cataloged here, do to our credibility when it well, I, moves into other countries? I, I, and I mean, I can think of a specific example. I mean, I remember we had been advocating for a very long time for, for, for President Obama to raise directly with Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey concern about right. that country's press freedom record. Turkey is actually the world's leading jailer of journalists. They jail more journalists in Turkey than they jail in any uh, other country in the world. And uh, Turkey is a key strategic ally. They have a very uh, deep uh, relationship with the United States, a strategic relationship. Uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Erdogan have established a personal rapport, a friendship. And so we've been advocating for some time uh, that uh, President Obama intervened directly with Prime Minister Erdogan and raised concerns. Well, they had a bilateral meeting back in May. And the, I think the day before that meeting took place, news about the seizure of the AP phone records broke. Now, I don't know whether it was on the agenda for that discussion. I had early indications that it might be. But I'm reasonably confident it did not come up. Because um, if President Obama had raised that, I think that he would have been very exposed. I mean, the same sort of thing happens with the uh, NSA uh, uh, surveillance and uh, uh, the, the um, uh, stated policy that uh, President Obama had articulated that he was going to be more aggressive in challenging China on its government orchestrated hacking surveillance program, whatever you want to call it, um, I don't hear that so much anymore. I don't hear that so much anymore. It's and I don't, th to rid, I, don't, I don't think that's a coincidence. I should add that, uh, I don't know how many of you here work for the government or did work for the government. Uh, it, 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 the leaks investigations, uh, the constant pressure to stop leaks of any kind, not just national security leaks, the constant pressure to not talk to reporters at all, but instead refer them to public affairs officers who then discourage the reporters from even writing stories, and then just the presence of the NSA surveillance, which so far there are no examples of American uh, uh, sources or reporters having been spied on through, the, through the, the, uh, this, this communication surveillance process, but its very existence. All those things combined uh, have this tremendous chilling effect on government officials talking to the press. Since the report comes out, I've been stopped by reporters in the Washington Post newsroom when I visited, for example, who said, oh, I wish you'd talk to me, too. I've got like 12 <laughs> other examples. As it was, the keep CPJ people said, don't keep quoting Post people in your report. But I mean, th this is their daily life. Their daily life is trying to get government officials to talk to them who are afraid to talk to them. That's not the way it should be. And there certainly does seem to be uh, a link between the NSA program, the other sorts of uh, government surveillance issues that have come up and reporters not feeling comfortable in sending an email to a government source. Uh, let me ask, uh, the Post had an exceptional story a few weeks ago about the effect of these leak investigations on the whistleblowers. And it was it really sort of cataloged how going up against the, the mechanisms of the United States government as one person can destroy lives, even for, even for those for whom the prosecution fell apart and they've been fined. Uh, do you think that some of these early prosecutions that didn't seem pointed toward true national security information that would damage the United States were really done to make a point and to say, this is what can happen to you, so don't talk to anyone? We, we don't know about that motivation in terms of the Justice Department, but we do know, because they said so, that the intelligence community was looking for that. Uh, a previous uh, director of national intelligence at the beginning of the administration uh, told the New York Times on the record uh, that uh, this, this, was, this was his intention, to get the Justice Department to prosecute some people so it would have a chilling effect on the others. 
Could we talk a little bit about the, uh, the insider threat program? Because I thought your discussion yeah. of that was yeah. exceptional. Mm -hmm. And it, you can imagine how um, the government would have some sort of a program after the disclosure that Chelsea Manning had taken the scope of documents that she had. Um, just to sort of get your arms around how documents are being handled. Right. It seems to have become something quite different. Oh, I've got that. Right. It, uh, uh, it, yes, it, it, it's uh, the original presidential directive uh, that set up the study that then produced the Insider Threat Program, which they started rolling out late last year, uh, did emphasize the national security aspects of it. But then it was left up to each individual agency to decide how to carry it out. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the news bureaus here in Washington, the McCl McClatchy News Bureau, uh, did a very good job of surveying various government agencies to see what, how they were carrying this out. Uh, and a number of them made, made clear that any kind of leaking to the press was the same as giving something to China. Uh, and, uh, and also that you're supposed to be monitoring your fellow employees. This is a kind of 1984 thing. Uh, monitoring your fellow employees to see, do you, do you see any signs of their leaking documents or being unstable or anything like that? And you're required to report that. And you can get in trouble for not reporting something that somebody else is doing that you may find suspicious. Again, that's, uh, I, that's I think, unprecedented in American history. And it, it, since it's just now being rolled out, we don't yet know what its effect is. But it has to be further chilling. Interesting. And it seems to have a, a chilling impact already on just day-to-day -day routine business. Uh, the, the sorts of, of work that journalists in this town do every single day that, that in many cases has nothing to do with top secret or even material classified at a lower level uh, or, or anything to do with national security matters. Um, the, the, the simply calling up a, 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 an official in this administration, in, in the White House or in a cabinet agency, um, and, and wanting to have a discussion about a subject that perhaps a senior official has spoken about publicly the day before, <laughs> whatnot, um, is the sort of thing that, that now uh, routinely, commonly, uh, government uh, employees will, will refuse to engage, not just on the record, but even in many cases on background. It's like, I can't even speak to you on background until it's cleared by the press office. Uh, and in many cases, the press office won't even authorize that. They'll say, we'll talk to you. Or in some cases, they won't talk to you. So it's created this chilling effect across the government. Um, and, and it has impeded the work of journalists to provide necessary accountability function uh, to our government. You know, think back to, we were talking about overclassification as, 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 as was one of these problems. And, and that is a problem rife throughout our government, but particularly in the, the parts of the government I cover, the military uh, and the intelligence community. And, you know, one way that um, people at all levels are, are simply trying to, in some ways, defeat or impede Freedom of Information Act requests is now um, routine correspondence, uh, anodyne correspondence, is slapped with the for official use only label. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're trying to get a document, it may not be classified. Uh, and even if it is classified, in many cases, it's not even all that, all that sensitive, but they'll say, oh, we can't release it. It's, it's for official use only. And, and what I want to do is bring that press person to my office, show them my inbox, and show them hundreds of emails from military officers, all stamped for official use only, saying, you know, would you like to come to this lunch with General Odierno next week <laughs> for official use only? Um, and, and because they're set, they're, 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 their email systems are all set to that as a default. So again, it's intended to in part, impede the ability of people making uh, legitimate FOIA requests of government. And you know, all this also comes back to, you know, there's, there's a, it's all about selective enforcement. And there, there, there is a, uh, I mean, there was a, there was a, a piece uh, just uh, reported uh, uh, the other day off of uh, you know, the, the, the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee um, getting uh, uh, in wake of, of the, the, the administration's rules on, on, on reporting uh, uh, the disclosures of sensitive information, that uh, distinguishing between what is an authorized leak and what is an unauthorized right. leak. Right. And you know, how many times on any given day do senior officials sit and share material that is classified or that is um, otherwise sensitive but serves their own purposes for which there is no sanction. I mean, I, I've been in the presence of numerous military senior officers who are showing me classified slides, but because it is serving the military's purposes, it's serving the administration's arguments, and so they, they, they're willing to trot that stuff out when it is helpful to them. But 
when they don't like it, of course, different rules. This is all about government accountability. The president has said repeatedly that he believes in government accountability, that the press has a role in holding the government accountable. But these kinds of distinctions are exactly that. They don't allow the government to be held accountable. The administration gets out its story, its message, and you're impeded from reporting other things that would hold them accountable. It did seem to me that the report is, is almost like a, it's the tale of two scenarios. One is the national security scenario, yes. and the other, as you've described, is the day-to-day -day business of government that right. it's difficult to report on. Um, I was struck both by your quote and by Ann Compton's quote that this was the most difficult um, administration to cover of the seven that she has covered, yes. which really is saying quite a lot. Yes, things that were routine in other administrations, uh, access to uh, beginnings and endings of meetings in the White House, just who's attending those meetings, just what the subject of the meeting is, uh, are, are now off limits and are impossible to find out unless you go to the White House website. Another uh, a, a, a British uh, television uh, news director here in Washington said that whenever he calls the White House to ask for something, they simply say, go to this website and see what we put up on the website. That's what you can have. You can have that video, you can have those photographs, you can have that information. We're not talking to you. Interesting. And you, your, your example about the EPA, I think quoting Ellen Weiss, I mean, uh, yeah, how much of what the EPA does is right. classified, right? right? But try getting meaningful information out of that agency. Right. I also found that um, something that really did alarm journalists about the, the Jim Rosen case, and we've had both the James Risen and James right. Rosen cases yeah. in, yeah. in yeah. short order, yeah. but the, about the Rosen case was the uh, the use of the term, uh, you know, co potential co-conspirator yes. under the Espionage Act yes. for, as you pointed out, activities that really are basic journalism. Right. It, it was a, there was a technical legal reason for doing that, but it still was very, very alarming. And while the administration repeatedly says, and says in the new Justice Department guidelines, we're not going to prosecute a journalist just for doing their job of reporting, again, that's their definition, not ours. Uh, and so it's still, it's frightening the reporters. That the, I, there are reporters who particularly work in the national security area who are worried about being vulnerable themselves still uh, to investigation and prosecution, who are taking extraordinary measures, encryption of emails, although we now know that NSA is trying to solve that riddle as well, encryption of emails, uh, secret, uh, secret rooms where they do their work and so on, which, uh, which, you know, which, which is quite amazing. I, I also should point out that in the Jim Risen case, uh, the, uh, the decision by the uh, appellate court judge uh, for the majority uh, that said that he still has to testify or go to jail uh, also said that what, this crime could not have been committed without him. In other words, they're still treating him as a criminal as well. So is this something that you see in terms of um, uh, the, the, the types of news gathering techniques that have to be used? Are we sort of going back to meeting deep yeah. throat in the basement of the Arlington parking garage? and? not using these electronic tools that have been so useful in the past decade? Uh, you know, I, I joke that, that th th this is forcing me to go back to being a lot more low tech. Um, you know, a lot more face-to-face um, uh, -face interviews, a lot more notes taken, you know, ink on paper. I know I much, you know, uh, o only for, you know, completely, you know, routine, not very sensitive stuff. And even in that case, I'm not doing a whole lot of, you know, typing and putting stuff up on the cloud. I'm not keeping my most sensitive contacts, you know, on my iPhone or in any sort of electronic space. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have colleagues who go even further, you know, working on machines that have no, you know, internet connection, working in, in, um, in rooms that are sort of the journalist equivalent of a, of a SCIF, a secure compartmentalized intelligence facility, um, to, to prevent, uh, uh, outsiders from, from trying to identify sources. And this is all, look, there's nothing that, that I'm, I'm working on, and I think for many of my colleagues, that you know, if, if, if the government uh, were to, to learn you know, the substance of the story that I'm, I'm, I'm building, that's fine. What I'm worried about is protecting the sources. Sure. I'm worried about, sure. about you know, keeping people who are cooperating with me from you know, getting hauled in front of an, uh, you know, e e to court and, and into jail for, um, uh, in, in, in almost every case, what is a, uh, a legitimate, well-founded reason for communicating. These are not people who are you know, seeking to, to you know, burn down the government house. These are not people engaging in wholesale theft of information. These are people talking about specific issues in a narrow, uh, circumscribed way uh, because they either want to, they believe policy is fundamentally flawed, they believe that, that there is an injustice that needs to be addressed, 
Um, you know, we, we lose sight of this when we focus so much on, on, uh, on Manning or on Snowden. Um, the, 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 the lion's share of these cases don't involve individuals uh, taking uh, volumes, reams of documents and then you know, sharing them with the world. It is, it is more often uh, an individual wanting to share a, 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 a specific piece of information because they believe that there is a compelling public interest in doing so. They're not doing this because they want to make money. They're not doing this because they want to aid the enemy. They're doing it because they want to help the United States. And, and I would just add, you know, just from, a, from an international perspective, as Len pointed out, if you're a journalist outside the United States, if you're a non-US person, you have no legal protection from uh, NSA uh, intervention in your communication. We know, or we, we don't know, but it's certainly uh, been, been reported based on Snowden leaks. Uh, Der Spiegel did a piece that the NSA hacked into the internal email of Al Jazeera. Um, now, you may argue Al Jazeera is a special case, but nevertheless, they did feel that this was uh, uh, within their uh, prerogative to do this. I've talked to editors, for example, the editor of the Guardian, uh, the US editor was talking about, um, you know, she uh, uh, does not communicate using uh, email with, with her reporters. You know, just that it does, does not feel secure doing that. Um, and, you know, lots of journalists that I talk to outside the United States are taking extraordinary measures to, to ensure that they can communicate uh, securely. And I think there's a real question. I mean, one of the most essential um, things that, you know, elements of, 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 of certainly public accountability journalism it is, depends on the, the ability of the journalist to be able to protect the identity of their confidential source. Right. And a lot of journalists just don't feel they can make that promise. And, and, in this environment. and journalists care about that. Which yeah. is, uh, people don't often, it was great to hear Rajiv yeah. talk about yeah. that because people don't often realize how much journalists do care about the welfare of their sources. Yeah, very true. Uh, also from the international perspective, yeah. uh, it's been interesting to me to learn that many other countries have stronger protections for uh, journalists in terms of uh, not, ha not requiring them to testify in court cases, yeah. for example, yeah. uh, than even we have on the state side where we do have protection. Yeah. Uh, in most of our states. Yeah, we're not, we're definitely, the U.S. is definitely, I mean, we obviously we have the First Amendment and the most, um, uh, probably the world's most uh, 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 protected environment is what you can say. You can absolutely say just about anything. Uh, but in terms of protection uh, against um, um, being subpoenaed, um, there are many other countries in the world that have stronger protections for journalists. We're, we're the U.S. is definitely not a, a, a leader in that regard. And at this point, there is no federal protection in federal right. cases. It's right. only state by state, which and they vary some state by state. But if you're subject to a federal investigation, your source is subject to a federal investigation. There is no, there's not yet any uh, any shield law, which can be very arbitrary. In fact, I mean, in, in the district, you yes. can get a. You can get a subpoena issued by the Superior Court right. and have great protections because right. of DC's Free Flow of Information Act, which is a good shield law. Right. If it's issued literally across the street right. from the federal courthouse, you're looking at testifying or going to jail. So yes. it's, it's, it's a very sort of arbitrary situation. We yes, have it is. yes, it is. And even though the Justice Department guidelines have been greatly strengthened and there are a lot of technical changes made in them that please media lawyers, right. you still generally still have this uh, intent involved because there's enough of a leeway there for the Attorney General's decision making and the national security exemption that they can still, by and large, do what they want to do. Well, and at the end of the day, guidelines are, in fact, guidelines. guidelines. Uh, they, right. can be, they can be followed or they cannot be followed, yes. and it's not enforceable by the reporter. You can't say to a court, the subpoena needs to be quashed because Correct. they didn't follow the guidelines. And Correct. so, you know, having a shield law, it seems to me, would be a step forward. It would be. Uh, why don't we talk about that for a moment? Sure. Uh, I know, Joel, you've, you've had concerns about the definition of journalist, for right. example, right. in a shield law, which right. is something that um, is one of the reasons why we've never had a federal shield law is because it's, it's, it's difficult to define and yeah. it's become more difficult in the past 10 years. Well, I look at this from an international perspective. I mean, I don't look at this strictly from a U.S. perspective. And I look at this in the context of you know, how radically technology has changed the way that journalism is conducted. And you know, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a very pragmatic argument, which is that journalists can't do their work if they can't protect their sources. And a shield law will help them do that. And a shield law will probably help you know, most journalists who work for um, um, tradition, who are carrying out traditional journalism, except for the national security exemption, which is a separate matter. But in terms of CPJ's constituency, 
in this country, but even more so globally, not all journalists will be covered. Not all journalists will be covered because a lot of people who are engaged in journalism in this day and age are doing it informally. They're observers to um, uh, um, newsworthy events, and they're documenting that news, those newsworthy events, sometimes in a systematic way, and then disseminating that information to the public. Or they're blogging about it, but they're doing it informally. Or they're documenting uh, events using video. And so some of the journalists, some of the people that we consider journalists in places like Syria, or China, or Vietnam, um, or Cuba, or places where people are using new techniques to engage in the practice of journalism, certainly any definition of the shield law that is being contemplated uh, in this country would exclude them. So we, 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 we are advocating our recommendation, recognizing that a shield law would help many journalists, is that the definition be as broad as possible. And, and to focus, to the extent that it's possible, on the news gathering process, rather than on credentials or professional status or anything like that. We think that would be um, the best approach. So if, if, uh, if a law did have the, the breadth that you're looking for, right. CPJ would be um, OK with the concept of having a well, shield law? No, we're definitely OK with the concept. And, and we're even, you know, frankly, hedging a little bit because we, don't, we think a shield law is useful. We're just, we're just saying that we're going to monitor the debate and we're going to push right to the end for the broadest possible definition. Right. That's our position. And it, the, the, the definitional one does seem to be difficult now because if anyone, if, if literally anyone could be covered simply by starting a blog, then it'll be difficult to imagine how Congress would ever pass that it's, law. That's, so that's, there's, that's, a, there's, a, there's a, a bit that, of a pragmatic that's, issue. That's my on, point. There's a pragmatic, there's a, there's, there's there's a a pragmatic good point. You're, you're balancing the kind of uh, a, you know, philosophical approach to this issue. And some people who I greatly admire say, you know, we, we, we shouldn't have a shield law at all because the First Amendment is the shield law. And the First Amendment does, you know, and I'm no. not necessarily, you're, this is, <laughs> you're deep into these <laughs> issues, but I'm just saying that's a view that's out there. But we're taking we're take a much more pragmatic view of the issue. A shield law is going to protect journalists. We want journalists to be able to do their, their work, but we also would like to see the broadest possible definition. I think at one point we did have a hope that the First Amendment would be enough, but Jim Biden's <laughs> case sort of demonstrates yeah. that unfortunately it isn't. Um, Rajiv, how much do these sorts of issues play into um, your decision about whether to grant confidentiality to a source? I mean, if, you, if you're looking at now the uncertain um, environment we live in, uh, does it make it less likely that you would, you know, say, yes, I'll, I'll keep you confidential? Or is it, does it just become a, a more difficult, nuanced negotiation about what the confidentiality really means? You know, I. I, I probably, and, and this, this will make you, know, uh, you, the lawyer, shudder a little bit, and it, it, it may well make you know, the post-lawyer shudder. I, 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 I do, um, you know, I grant promises of confidentiality pretty liberally. That's what we have traditionally done. Um, now, uh, we, if anything, the, the, the pressure against it um, over the past, 10 plus years, maybe even longer than that, and this is one Len would know well, um, has been less traditionally in, in our newsroom about the threat of prosecution, but more in terms of the desire for transparency with our readers, right. wanting people to know as much as possible at who is providing that information. Um, and, and in some ways, this is a response to uh, government officials often wanting to speak about routine matters on background as a senior administration official as opposed to coming out there with name attached. And it is uh, over the years created this climate in Washington that you know you, you can't even you know get the weather report from somebody uh, with their <laughs> name attached. But on background, they'll tell you it's going to be raining this afternoon. Um, <laughs> and so our pushback has been sort of against that. Now uh, enter in now this this. Uh, this this new threat of of uh, not just threat the reality of 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 uh, investigations and prosecutions particularly in in the world that I cover um, it certainly has come up in discussions with sources um, you know and and uh, when it when it does come up on sensitive matters you know it's something that that we talk out and we and uh, but when I make an explicit promise of confidentiality it is 
just that, and, and I will honor that. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not a written agreement, but it is, it is part of what I see as my professional oath. Um, uh, but, but, but even getting to that point you know, requires, um, requires jumping through a lot of hoops that you know, we didn't have to before. It's, sure. it's, you know, it's the old face-to-face -face meeting. It's not, you know, it, it's not these, these deals are not struck over email or phone calls. Um, and it, the plant it, on the balcony if we need to meet. <laughs> yeah, not, not quite as convoluted as that, um, but, but, but certainly adding a, a lot more, um, you know, a lot more complications. Um, you know, in fact, uh, you know, the, uh, a lot more, you know, meetings of, with people uh, uh, at their homes or in, in, you know, in coffee shops or bars as opposed to in, in offices. Um, uh, you know, communicating with people with their, their personal email addresses, not their government ones, because of the insider threat program. It's not, it's not just the, the NSA that's the worry, it's that in every, any agency, right, their systems techs are, are going through as part of the insider right. threat program, you know, looking at, you know, what emails were exchanged with, you know, the washpost.com and nytimes.com's domains, um, and, you know, were any of those, e you know, messages coming from people who were not in the public affairs shop, and if not, Let's flag them for, for further scrutiny. Oh. That, that stuff is happening routinely. Yeah, and there's also there are two other elements, very important elements here for the reader, for the audience, and that those are accuracy and credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't talk to the people that really know what's going on, uh, you're liable to find other sources on background who have access to grind and so on who will tell you things, and you'll make mistakes. And we've seen that happen increasingly in national security reporting and law enforcement reporting. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the authoritative people won't talk, somebody else will, and, uh, and, and that's, that, that can create accuracy problems, and it can create a credibility problem for the medium involved. Now, administrations may have a, a, an interest in making the media seem less credible uh, by, by, by denying them accurate information, but, 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 that's, but that's serious for the audience. And Len, you've seen, um, you've seen these sorts of issues in national security reporting across a variety of administrations. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that this was the most secretive since uh, the Nixon administration. How would you compare it to some of the, the ones in between, say, the Bush administration or the, the second Bush administration? Uh, uh, as, as Rajiv said, they weren't, they weren't our friends, uh, and they weren't eager to have uh, some of the stories we published be published. Uh, but by and large, the, uh, first of all, the, the, the access to sources was much greater than it is now. They've really succeeded in tightening up access to sources. Uh, and secondly, you could have productive conversations. I think productive is the word I use in the report. Productive conversations with senior administration officials, sometimes including the President of the United States, which happened on at least one occasion in several mm -hmm. administrations, about whether or not it was a good idea to publish the story, about what the, story, what, what the accuracy of the story, and about whether or not there was any sensitive information that really could harm human life or national security. Sure. I don't recall ever in all my time of uh, 25 years as managing editor and executive editor of the Post, I don't recall us ever not publishing a story uh, that uh, an administration objected to, but I do know out of these very productive conversations that we did withhold technical information, names of things, countries of origin for sure. things that would harm national security, but would not deprive the reader of knowing what they needed to know about a government program or a government policy that they needed to know to hold the government accountable. And if you, if you cut off those conversations, then you're left with whatever WikiLeaks puts up without talking to anybody, right. including, you know, including names of, uh, of uh, people who could, who could be harmed because uh, their names appear in those uh, diplomatic cables and things that WikiLeaks put up. Right. Uh, that, that's, that's the other side of this. And also, it emboldens people I mean, Edward Snowden does believe that he's performed an important public service, and obviously you could argue in some ways he did based on the fact we now have a national debate over NSA surveillance programs that we did not have uh, before, he, before, he, uh, before he leaked all that information. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it makes them feel more heroic, if you will, when they know that otherwise Rajiv Chandrasekhar is not going to be able to get the, the information that wouldn't harm national security out through normal channels. Just, I'm just going to note, I mean, look at the front page of the Post today in the top left column about the NSA's role in, in drone strikes. And uh, the fifth or sixth paragraph of that story says that the Post withheld technical exactly. de details sure. uh, based on, on discussions with uh, uh, you know, administration officials and uh, intelligence community officials to avoid you know, 
divulging sources and methods, but at the same time, the substance of the story was able to come out, was able to add to the national debate over uh, uh, the, the, the role of the, the NSA. Well, and I always think of the Dana Priest series on black prisons as yeah. being a great example of yep. that. The issue was reported. The specifics right. exactly. were kept confidential, I assume, under a request from the government. Yes. So the, the, the secrecy the government needed to maintain was maintained, but the public was informed about the issue. That, that's a good example to cite. First of all, it was not a leak like an Edward Snowden leak. This was based on a long period of reporting by Dana in discovering that certain officials that she knew in the intelligence community were worried about something. Well, what were they worried about? Well, she would find a little bit from you, take it over to him, find a little bit more, take it over to him, then come back to you for some more. It was, re it was reporting. It was not a leak right. as such. Right. Uh, and, and she was able to do that kind of reporting. She was able to have enough access for that kind of reporting that we were able to put the whole picture together, including the fact that there was a lot of other uh, counter-terrorism counter, uh, 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 cooperation going on with the Eastern European countries where these secret black sites were located, that when the administration said, please don't name those countries, we knew why they were asking. And we could, we could reason about, okay, then we don't want to have this other cooperation cut off. So therefore, we published the stories, and, they, and the, the, only, the, the only effect of them was, at least it's been shown so far to me by the intelligence community, was that they had to close those black sites, bring those prisoners to Guantanamo which doesn't appear to harm national security at all. Uh, but at the same time, we've never named those Eastern European countries, even though they've been bandied about, there have been investigations by the EU to name them and so on. We've kept our promise not to name them. So that, that's an important part of this. Uh, uh, David Sanger, the national security reporter for the New York Times, talks about the uh, trust factor between you and the government and as you go about doing this reporting. Can they trust your motives? The, the news media's motives, can you trust the government's motives in dealing with you, that makes it possible to bring this information that needs to be brought to the American public in a way that's responsible. You start to cut off those avenues, David's very worried, you start to cut off those avenues, you're going to have a lot of irresponsible information sure. out there. Len's point about Dana's story on the black sites is, is, is incredibly important. I think there's a perception out there that national security reporters sit around in their offices and wait for the phone to ring and somebody right. sort of go, hey, here's your leak today. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work that way. There's a little bit of shoe leather uh, involved. If, if right. only, if only. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think, you know, Snowden is the exception, not right, the right, rule. And right, people right. think, oh, you know, hey, get the thumb drive with all this stuff. Uh, you know, oh, to be blessed with, you know, somebody like Snowden coming in <laughs> with, with this stuff. But in most cases, it's you're building on small piece of information, taking it, you know, learning more, learning more. And you're, you're, part of this is convincing people that it would be in the public interest to, to help provide some context, to help explain uh, something, to, 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 to add the, another piece to the puzzle. Um, and so you know, it would be wrong to think that, that all these, these individuals are just sort of there ready to kind of hand the stuff out. Uh, it often is, is the result of a, of a, of a thoughtful discussion and, and, and sources understanding what a journalist is trying to do and, and seeing what they're doing as being in the public interest. Coming back to you know, a point I made earlier, I, mean, I really do believe that for the, the, the vast majority of those people who the administration would call leakers, these are people who are acting out of, out of a, a, a sense of, 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 of altruism, out of a sense of, of, a, of a belief in our system and a, out of a desire to want to make the United States a, uh, a better country. Right. Um, it, it's not anarchistic behavior, even though uh, one could point perhaps to some like, higher profile recent cases and say, uh, and, and try, try to use labels like that. I think that that obscures the reality of, of what is happening in, in the lion's share of these interactions between journalists and sources. You do see a strong thread of patriotism through many of the sources that you're describing. Yes. Certainly. Uh, I and, and then if they're, if they're investigated, persecuted, fired, or prosecuted for it, uh, that, uh, that um, they, they then wonder if their patriotism was misplaced. Right, right. I was struck by um, something you reported about David Sanger from the New York Times, mm -hmm. that uh, there was a, an email sent out, for, or a memo sent out yes. from the White House to intelligence agencies saying, please retain any emails to David Sanger. Right. And within the White House itself, yeah. Right. I, I would say that would pretty much dry up your sources. Yes, it would. It, and and it, as he said, people called him, he would call somebody up and to ask him a question. And they'd say, David, we love you, but we just can't talk to you right now. <laughs> Let's wait till this all blows over. They know he's a responsible reporter. They know how intelligent he is. They know they would handle the information carefully, but they just can't talk to him. Yeah. I was also struck by uh, 
an anecdote in the report about someone from the government calling you to apologize for a subpoena they hadn't told you about. Yes. I wonder if you could recount that for us. Right. Well, this was quite some time ago uh, and uh, when uh, Mueller was the FBI director. And uh, we had a correspondent uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, so did, I think, the New York Times, right, in the same place. There was an investigation going on that had nothing to do with, uh, with the stories that we were publishing from there. Uh, but uh, or it didn't have that much to do with it. But, it, it, but the fact that they had contacts uh, with, uh, with people that were being investigated by the FBI. Uh, and without a complete violation of the Justice Department guidelines, uh, they secretly subpoenaed and seized their phone records. Uh, and it was discovered by the FBI afterwards, as in a previous administration, during the Bush administration. And uh, Mueller called, my, uh, call up, called me and the editor of the New York Times and, first of all, revealed that this had happened, which we didn't know, and then apologized for it because it was, it was outside the Justice Department guidelines he regarded as being wrong. People, people were dis disciplined for it. Uh, and uh, and th I thought that was a, the proper way to handle it. It's been a pretty extraordinary story. Um, there's a lot of talk about subpoenas of phone records, which uh, was what you're talking about there. And I was um, wondering about the Associated Press issue that you know, the, the subpoena seemed to cover a lot of phone lines, including one in the, in the Capitol itself. Yes. Um, did you have a sense that um, that was narrowed or that if, if a judge had been involved, there may have been a different result than tapping well, up to 100 journalists. Yeah, for and, that. and they did it without notifying the AP in advance. Again, right. in my experience uh, before this administration, quite often if the Justice Department was contemplating a subpoena in a, in a criminal investigation or in a civil case, uh, they, or, or some other way in which they w wanted to demand something from us, uh, they would call up and say, we're contemplating this, and we would have a negotiation. And usually we were able to satisfy their law enforcement needs and our protection of our reporting uh, techniques uh, needs uh, and work something out. Sometimes it took lots of negotiations, painful negotiations, but it would work out. In this case, they didn't notify the AP in advance. If they had, the AP would have said, oh, well, you do a hundred different reporters, you know, four, it wasn't just phone lines, it was, uh, it was switchboards, four switchboards and the phone and the AP phone in the Capitol. Why do you need that? Uh, and uh, let's, let's narrow it down. We don't want to cooperate with you at all. We don't want our reporter source discovered, but let's narrow down what you're doing here because you're exposing all of our reporting to scrutiny by the government. Uh, we don't think that's a good idea. And then if they couldn't have worked something out, they probably would have gone to court. And that's, of course, what the government didn't want. Even though the investigation by that time was years old, uh, they, they, just, they just didn't want to take the trouble to do that. So, that's that, that, so they, 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 they proceeded in a way in which there was no way to negotiate, no way to go to a court, and have a court decide whether or not this is a good idea. Well, you've all been very patient, uh, and so I thought this would be a good, a good moment to turn uh, to the audience for questions. Um, let's see, we've got some in the back, and then we'll move up front. I'm going to take Chloe's prerogative here. Uh, you, in the report, you quote Bob Schieffer saying it's gotten worse every administration. Yes. Right. It seems to track with sort of the development of media itself. Yes. That way back when, there were so few channels for an administration to get their own message out. They sort of needed the Post and the Times. So the posture of the administration was sort of had to be cooperative. But now between echo chamber media and their ability, as you mentioned, to get their word out themselves, right. they no longer, you no longer have that leverage as an institution to sort of force that posture on them. So the question is, are you optimistic there's any other way to regain that leverage to, re to change their posture to be more cooperative? Or is it sort of an inexorable curve down. Yeah, I think it's inexorable unless they're confronted with it, unless the public's confronted with it, and unless the, they're, you know, an appeal to their better angels. This is why I assume Joel asked me to do this report, uh, is they're, they're going to go to the administration with their recommendations for improvements. This is a president who promised to have the most transparent administration in history. He still has more than two years to carry that out and add that to his legacy. So we're essentially appealing to his better nature to, to do what you said you were going to do. And, he, and he's repeatedly repeated this when he's confronted with some of these issues. He says, I really want a transparent administration. I really want the press to be able to hold us accountable. So I think by proving that that has not happened to him, I'm hoping that he will take some steps. Otherwise, the lesson for the next administration would be, yeah, let's see how much more sophisticated we can be uh, in, uh, in keeping the press at bay. Thank you. Our way to the front. 
Uh, thank you for bringing out this very important information, Mr. Downey. Um, <clears throat> I think, and I'm going to follow up, I guess, a little on the other gentleman's question or concern with the impact of how the federal uh, whistleblower stuff will s is going to flow down to the state and local levels along with the increase in websites. I guess we can thank Bill Gates for that. I don't know. But as newspapers become more difficult to hang on to, and I don't know what's going to happen to the Post when Amazon.com takes over and you're reporting to some degree, I think it's rather nice that you go talk to someone in person rather than via email. You get a better picture, a better story. I hope you're not being followed. But what impact w is our websites now having on reporting the news and getting out accurate news with so many different websites and cable right. channels and right. you name it, right. all there's, out there. There's both good news and bad news on that front. The bad news, obviously, is the disruption of the economic models that have supported legacy journalistic organizations. And we're all struggling with that. And by the way, the Post is not now owned by Amazon, but by Jeff Bezos personally. Uh, and therefore, it's not a public company, and uh, which gives him a great more financial leeway in, in trying to deal with that particular issue. At the same time, there are people that have started up, both for-profit and non-profit, all kinds of new news organizations. In fact, the founder of eBay has just announced he's going to start a new one with Glenn Green Greenwald uh, from, uh, from uh, the Edward Snowden papers. Uh, and uh, uh, so that uh, a lot of these new startups uh, are competing in, the, in that space, and they are, uh, even though they have much fewer resources, some of them are doing really good work. Uh, and uh, I, I, this is another thing that I spent a lot of time studying and writing about. They're fragile. They need support. Some of them are stronger financially than others. They're, they're essentially, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're public interest organizations, if you will, uh, like NPR or, or uh, public broadcasting. Uh, and so uh, they're, 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 their future, in, in individual one's future are, are in doubt. But as an aggregate, they're going to be there. And then that's, that's very helpful, I think, too. Uh, and they also collaborate with traditional news organizations. So the New York Times, the Washington Post, other newspapers around the country have published a number of things pr uh, provided them by, non by nonprofit investigative reporting sites, uh, which is very useful. To come back to the first part of your question with states, yeah, so some states are, one of these nonprofits is uh, called Wisconsin Watch in Madison, Wisconsin. And the state legislature try to legislate them out of existence because their they uh, 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 they, their offices are inside the University of Wisconsin, and some of the uh, people who run it are on the University of Wisconsin faculty. So somebody sneaked into it, nobody's owned up to it yet. Sneaked into the state budget a prohibition against state funds or university funds being used to work with them at all. It finally, after a big uproar, was vetoed by the governor. But it does show that uh, yeah, individual states are trying to uh, get get involved in, in uh, managing the news as well. How long do you think it would take to do the shield law pass? How long? I mean, the shield law. The expert sitting next to me. <laughs> oh, is that him? Oh, what's well, holding it up? Why aren't you moving ahead with it's this? Actually, it's the, the movement on the Senate side has been good so far. We were past the Senate Judiciary Committee. We just need to get to the floor of the Senate. And the Senate's got a lot going on, of course. So it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been a little bit difficult to get their attention on this one. But you know, we're optimistic that we should be able to get to the floor of the Senate um, if not before the end of this year and early next year. We, there is a House bill that's been introduced by Representative Ted Poe um, and S uh, Representative John Conyers that is moving ahead as well. I think there'll have to be hearings on that one, so it may take a little longer. But you know, we've, we've had some success in the past. We passed the House twice um, in 2007, 2009. Um, so we're, we're optimistic. Uh, it, it actually is bipartisan. And in, you know, for many years, our greatest champion uh, was Representative Mike Pence, um, Republican from Indiana, who basically said, look, I'm not doing this because I love the media. In fact, sometimes I don't like you guys, but I really believe in protecting whistleblowers. Yeah, it's a constitutional issue. So many conservatives see it as a constitutional issue, as they should. Can I just go back and, and build upon uh, some of Len's answers on, on these past two questions? Um, I, I, don't, I don't want you to, to shudder here, but, but there is... <laughs> You're doing there, your best. <laughs> well, look, the, there, there is a defense to be, to be made of, 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 of a group that everybody, at least in, in part of the political spectrum, loves to hate, which is the mainstream media. Um, yes, there is a proliferation of new news websites at the state, local, and even at the, at the national level. Uh, new ventures here and there, uh, citizen journalists, and, and all of that is to be applauded. But when you look at these cases, the, 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 you know, 
New York Times, Washington Post, Siobhan Gorman Drake, Wall Street Journal, Fox, Fox News. Oh, they're part of the mainstream media. Right. Don't, don't, don't listen to what they have to, how they brand themselves. They are, they are, they are mainstream and large. Uh, it's because these are organizations that have, at least for the moment, deep enough pockets so they can sustain the sort of investigative journalism uh, that th this is not the leaks flowing in. This is often the result of a lot of hard work. It's, it's stuff that takes time. Um, it, ta it takes, takes money. Expertise? And, yes. And so um, this, while I think, yes, this pro that, that these issues do pose a, th a threat to, to, to journalists writ large, uh, what we've seen thus far, and in my humble opinion, you know, I think the, the, the principal kind of threat still going forward is to, you know, the, the, the largest news organizations out there, those that can, that, that really devote resources to covering national security matters and such. Um, and so, um, and, and you know, the flip side of it for, for the administration, uh, any administration should be the track record of these large organizations. You know, I'd like to think, and I, I know I have friends in the military and the intelligence community that, that, that laugh when I say this, saying, you know, who put you guys in charge of determining what the public should know? But, you know, um, when, when, when presented with um, uh, sensitive, uh, material, particularly of national security nature, uh, the, the, the ma mainstream news organizations have almost always undertaken a thoughtful examination of, of how to publish, when to publish, what to publish. I mean, these were the issues Len agonized with time and time again as Absolutely. executive editor of the Washington Post. Right. Um, and even when provided with the entire WikiLeaks trove, we didn't go and put it all online. We used it as a basis for journalism and then going out and asking people. Washington Post, through Bart Gelman, in the receipt of material from Edward Snowden. Again, the raw documents aren't just being pasted up willy-nilly out there. They're being used to, 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 to engage in journalism, and, 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 and portions of it are being put up there. And to do reporting based on them that only with somebody with the expertise of Bart and several other reporters yes. at the Post can handle that way too. Oh, and just on overclassification, I, I, I can't let this event go without noting, you know, I love to, see, I guess it was the Guardian and then, and then eventually the Post, um, was it last week or the week before, um, had the stories about you know, the NSA trying to, to, to crack this, this TOR system. And, and among the slides uh, that were um, uh, revealed, uh, I think in the Guardian report, was this, uh, this NSA deck about you know, what TOR is and how to defeat it, you know, all classified, you know, top secret, no foreign. Um, and, and two of those slides were actually material that the NSA essentially stole from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, <laughs> their own <laughs> descriptions of TOR. They slapped it in you know, the frame of a NSA PowerPoint and then slapped you know, top secret, no foreign on it. Um, and, and so again, there are in these own documents. There are legitimate questions. People talk about overclassification. Yeah. There are legitimate questions well, to be asked about. Uh, that. Among the thousands of pages of documents that uh, Chelsea Manning gave to uh, WikiLeaks were uh, thousands of newspaper stories yeah. uh, in various foreign countries that were then classified as secret when they were sent on to Washington. It's just crazy. Uh, this, where's our microphone? Okay. Why don't we go here and then here? Thank you. Uh, in any kind of um, federal shield law, you're probably going to get national security exceptions. So in that particular field, is it really going to help you? I mean, maybe you get prior notice, maybe you get judicial involvement, but how much is it going to contribute in the national security field? I don't see a shield law as, as, as fundamentally changing the game for national security reporting there. It's an, it's an issue of both prosecutorial discretion, but really it is, it is uh, a, an issue of, of how an administration at, its, at senior most levels chooses to address these issues and whether um, it wants to create a sort of chilling effect across the, uh, the Defense Department and the intelligence community or whether it believes that in our system and for our system to be healthy, yeah, every now and again you might get something on the front page of the Post or the Times or some other uh, newspaper that you won't really like, but, but our country is, is, is strong enough, resilient enough to move on from it and, um, and that uh, 
though some of those disclosures actually uh, help uh, to 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 stimulate the national debate. And that you know, look, the reality of it is that while uh, the administration likes to talk about you know Congress playing a great oversight role, if if you know, if there's a among the key takeaways from from the Snowden affair thus far is that. Uh, you know, Congress really wasn't doing a whole lot of oversight over the NSA. Thank you. First, a very good job of showing us we're closer to 1984 maybe than we are 2013. <laughs> a little <laughs> chilling in the afternoon. We're not going to walk out here smiling. My question is this, though. We have President Obama, and Len, you kind of alluded to this, I think may be a very secretive person just in his personal life, but he's mm -hmm. president, okay? And now he's head of an administration, which is, which is very secret. But how much of that, to anyone who's, who's looking at it, how much of that is him leading and how much of that is him following? In other words, post 9-11 and post what the security feel. And it doesn't matter in the end result, right. I understand that. Right. The only reason that question would matter is for those of us who feel that it is wrong and needs to change it, we first need to know where to focus that change on. So is it more in the general belief of you know, directors and that type of thing? Or do you think it's coming directly from the White House? Or just where would you assign, you know, you're doing a pie chart. Where does it fall? Yeah, I, you know, the derivation, it appears to me, comes from a combination of those factors. The post 9-11 world, uh, pressure from the intelligence community and, and both parties, uh, particularly in 2012 when the president was running for re-election, mm -hmm. and the Republicans would treat every leak as though he was doing, he was doing the leaking in order to get re-elected. And so the response was to conduct investigations, whether they should have been conducted or not. But the, the second part of your question is, what, what can you do about it? He has the power to do it. He has the power. He, he issued those directives. He has the power to see that those directives are actually fulfilled, and they haven't been yet. So he, he can do it. This gentleman across the aisle. Yeah. Um, the uh, microphone. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Byrne. I'm the original editor of Tax Notes magazine. We played a central role in wiping out Nixon on his income taxes back there when he, he or, or, crooked lawyer of his uh, faked a gift of his vice presidential right. papers to the, what you call it, and the Washington Post played a major role in that. Well, right. But the, uh, the hero of it all was a leaker. It mm -hmm. was the IRS employee at Martinsburg, West Virginia, who mailed his tax returns to the Providence Journal, right. uh, who helped get him caught eventually. But uh, the, um, uh, so I have somewhat of a historical background of that leaking business, but my real question is, how, where do things stand on these pieces of legislation you talk about uh, on, on uh, the shield laws on the issue of the definition of who's a journalist? I mean, I favor the most broad definition possible. Right. Where are those things? Where are those things? Well, uh, I'm, w I'm with you in terms of a broad definition. The problem is if, if it's so broad that it catches everyone, then you're giving a privilege to everyone in the U.S., which is something the Congress wouldn't pass. Uh, the way that it's set up now, there, it's essentially a three-tiered definition. Um, it started off as a one-paragraph definition, and as it, it became longer and longer as the process went on. But the idea was to catch more, uh, more people who are really committing journalism. So the, the first test is the straightforward one that you tend to see in state shield laws. Uh, are you, uh, do you work for, have a contract with, or an agent for um, an entity that publishes uh, a news website, a, a mobile app, a newspaper, TV station? And it's, it's quite broad. So I think most bloggers who have an entity, uh, when you think of blogs like Talking Points Memo um, or others, Matt Drudge, they'd be covered under that along with the Washington Post and the New York Times. There's a second um, definition that says, okay, if you don't fall into that bucket, you can be covered if you have engaged in journalism in the past. And that's one that was pointed out in the report. If you um, worked as a journalist for one of these entities for one year in the past 20 years or contributed significantly to um, a product as a freelancer in the past five years, you can be covered. Then there's a third bucket that says, okay, even if you're not covered under one and two, if the judge decides in the interests of justice that you should be covered, you will be. So that's the way that the, the, uh, the Senate bill has that structure. The House bill is a much more straightforward structure that basically says if you're um, engaging in the journal in journalistic activities uh, for financial livelihood you're covered uh, that's something that has been a little bit controversial in the past because you have people who are doing it for nonprofits and we need to find a way to cover them too uh, but the the three the sort of three bucket structure is in the Senate bill and we think that's the one that'll end up on the floor yes 
Oh, and I should, have, I should have said this before, but please say your affiliation as well, since we're on C-SPAN. I'm Mark Sobolski. I'm with a, a created an LLC called Great Teaching, but I, I have a master's in journalism. I used to be a, a columnist in a small newspaper. Um, now that you, this report has been rolled out, and it is a very important report, I believe. I mean, how far have we come since the Pen Pentagon Papers? Some, some distance. Um, what are your plans to roll this out in terms of connecting directly with the public? It seems to me that the, the true test of whether this is going to reverberate in the White House and back is how the public is going to react to it because there is a national security issue that is lingering, as it says, since 2001, and I think it, you're gonna, you may get some pushback against that. So how are we going to know how this is going to resonate with the public? Well, I mean, first of all, we've been very pleased that it has resonated. I mean, it's gotten trem a tremendous amount of attention, more than we expected uh, in the media itself. I mean, that's natural, but we're seeing a lot of interest on social media, for example, and a lot of discussion and a lot of engagement. That is great. That is really what we were hoping for. And in terms of our strategy, if you go to the last page, we have our recommendations. And as I mentioned, those recommendations were developed uh, by the CPJ staff and the board of directors in consultation with lots of other groups. We sent the report and the recommendations to the president. And in that um, letter in which we sent the recommendations, we also asked um, for a meeting with our board. And we are going to be following up on that request, and we actually hope to have some sort of face-to-face -face dialogue about these issues with uh, senior figures in the administration. Um, and we're not obviously we're not the only group that's out there that's working on these issues. Um, and so we're you know looking where we can to build coalitions, build awareness. And, and you know one of the things I said when we when we when we had um, the press conference is that I think that. The challenge is that the administration doesn't see this as a problem, or they haven't seen it as a problem. They saw the little flare-up when there was a where there was a very considerable outcry after the confiscation of the AP phone records, and they sort of feel, well, we've addressed that with the new Justice Department guidelines. Well, what this report is saying is, you're wrong. This is a problem. It's a very significant problem. It has to do with your legacy. It has to do with the kind of government that this country has and deserves, um, and, and we are seeing a response from the public as a whole. So you know, that's the strategy. You're right that the, uh, the, overly the overlying challenge is the national security environment. That's true here. It's true in many other countries around the world. Um, and, and we're willing to engage um, with um, the government on that issue or the administration. We know they have very significant challenges, but national security in this country or any other country can never be used as a pretext to give the government authority to prevent people from getting the information they need. And that's what we're, that's what we're gonna push back with. And I'm talking about it to the media regularly. There have been lots and lots of appearances of various kinds and it's been well covered in the news media. And look, this is also an administration that, that wants the American people to, well, let me put it differently, uh, a president, has, has, has said explicitly to the American people that the tide of war is receding. He yeah. said, we are entering a different period now than we have been in in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, accept or not that, that perhaps the standards are different uh, in a time of, of outright war or in the immediate aftermath of, of a nation getting attacked the way it did in 2001, um, this is a president who said, look, we are entering a different period. So um, should not the way the administration addresses some of these matters also evolve? Joel, could you uh, say a few words about the administration's reaction to the report? Because I, there has been a little bit. There's been a little bit of a reaction. They basically uh, issued a statement uh, reaffirming you know, what they said to Len, that you know, we're committed to transparency, and this is the most transparent administration. That, to me, suggests that they're still very defensive. Uh, we, don't, we don't agree with that. We don't agree that they're the most transparent uh, administration. We want to talk about it. But, so there's been some reaction, um, you know, but I, I, I hope by uh, you know, looking for direct engagement, um, we can actually sit down and discuss these issues. And I'm hopeful that uh, the report itself and Len's um, uh, ongoing outreach and, 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 and media um, around the report will 
um, make the case to them that this is, this is a critical issue that's not going away and that the, the best response is to sit down and engage and, and try and address some of these issues. The gentleman in the blue shirt. And please state your affiliation. Yeah. Uh, Claude Porcella from uh, Radio France International. As a foreign journalist, I find your report very disheartening because uh, <laughs> the way you describe uh, the way the, the administration is ending the press reminds me a little bit of the way the African governments uh, uh, do with their own press, and I'm a little familiar with that part of the world. So uh, can you tell us something that uh, give us a little bit of hope? <laughs> and <laughs> is that... Uh, is it going to be better uh, <laughs> under the next administration? Might it yeah. be Hillary Clinton right, as president or, uh, or Ted Cruz? <laughs> right. Uh, I've heard it said that an optimist, a pessimist is someone who says it couldn't possibly get any worse, and an optimist is someone who says, sure it can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of the administration's approach and techniques, I think a lot really will depend on whether or not Obama reacts to this. Uh, and decides that he is going to put more transparency uh, into this administration to set a different kind of uh, example for the next administration, whether it's Democratic or Republican. Uh, but I think the, uh, the, the main reason why I'm not hopeless at all uh, is that the media will push back. It is pushing back. We'll continue to push back. I, everybody in this report's on the record. You know, these, these reporters who have to deal with the White House every day you know, when David Sanger says this is the, uh, the most uh, closed uh, um, control, freak. control freak administration in, in, yeah. in my experience, he knows he's going to have to talk to him the next day. So they clearly are pushing back. Uh, the media is pushing back. And I think that that will help the balance out in the long run. So even if the next administration tries to be more controlling, the media is still going to be very aggressive. And it's, it's, uh, we'll see how the balance works out. But I, my appeal here, in particular in this report, and Joel's appeal, is this president promised to be different. Uh, and, uh, and so far, he hasn't been different in a good way. And he's still got time to do it. Well, thank you very much. Um, please join me in thanking our wonderful speakers today. And thanks to all of you.